My name is Carolyn Delaney. I'm the founder and CEO here at Journey Enterprises. We're a media company on a mission to make recovery from addiction visible because it's important. It saves lives. There are 20, over 26 million of us in recovery, and we want those who are still sick and suffering to know that there's a path for them. There's millions of us here on the other side of active addiction, and that it's probable that people can and do recover. Our videos share personal intimate stories of what people's journeys were like, going from what it was like to what happened to what it's like now, um, in an effort to let people know that we're here, we care, and that there's a way out. Visible recovery saves lives, and we want the world to know that. So if you have a story about recovery and would like to share it, uh, please contact me, carolyn at recovery-journey.com. I hope you enjoy our videos. Um, I grew up in a very Italian um, family and, you know, there was always a lot of um, reasons to celebrate, um, a lot of homemade Italian wine, um, and as little kids, it was, you know, it was just custom, you know, um, we'd get a little sip, you know, or get a little, little Italian wine in our orange soda or so I really, and, and that's not, I mean, it was just culture back then. And I developed it. I liked the taste. I liked the feeling. Um, and I found myself drawn to it. So the phenomena of craving set in pretty young for me. Um, you know, and it, it progressed um, from where I was just given a little taste here and there to um going into my father's liquor cabinet you know and and i believe that's where i crossed the line um it was okay so i thought it was okay i liked the stuff i liked the little the warm glowing feeling that went down i went from you know being given it to stealing it right from the get-go um you know, I'd, I'd mix the water in with the alcohol so that nobody really knew that, you know, any level was disappearing from the bottles. I just wanted to escape, you know, a lot of things that happened, um, it, it was a setup for me from the get-go to want to escape and to not want to feel. Um, I never liked who I was. I always felt different. I felt like I didn't belong. Um, I was quiet and shy. I didn't say boo. And I found that, you know, it was liquid courage. And that that's what you hear a lot about in the halls. Um, it gave me the courage to, you know, to go out and to intermingle with people and you know i became like the class clown and i became like the hit of the party and um and it, it just was a way to deal with stuff and then um it progressed and it got worse i had an uncle who was a doctor and um I had free access to pain medication, uh, anti-anxiety medication, um, you name it. You know, back in the early 80s, they used to give, uh, the salesman would come over and give free samples. So he would keep it all in a closet and didn't keep any type of inventory. And my mom just happened to be his medical secretary and the office was in their house. And I kind of grew up in that house, so it was very easy for me to get access to prescription drugs. So um, I was on a mission of self-destruction from the get-go. I've um, 
lived a life of, you know, depression and victimhood and all that stuff. But always, always, there was a higher power, and I know that, and that's why it wasn't so difficult for me in the beginning. Uh, when I got to the program, when they talked about God, not the God that I grew up with, a uh, God of my understanding. You know, high school, I partied, I didn't care. That's the, you know, the theme of my life was I didn't care. You know, I didn't care about you. I didn't care about me. I didn't care about life. Um, you know, and then later on in my story, I'll, I'll tell you when I started to care about life and I started to take things seriously. Um, so anyway, I was on a mission of destruction. I was going to drink myself to death. I was going to take an overdose. I didn't care. I would pop pills. It, you know, the, it said I knew enough to, to look and see if it said warning that don't mix with alcohol or maybe habit forming. And if I knew if it said that, those were the good ones. And I better take more. Um, so anyway, I just thought I would end up dying someday. In 1986, I got introduced to um, the telephone company and I started working there. And, you know, my story um, of recovery started there. In 1989, through the EAP program, um, I was introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the story, and this is how my higher power works in my life. Up to this point in 1989, I didn't care. And I was drinking and I was, you know, doing drugs at work. And there was this one woman that whatever corner I turned, um, she'd be coming in the other way. So like God was putting this woman in my, right in my face, smack in my face. And um, I eventually found out she was a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it was the first sign God gave me that, you know, here's an opportunity, you know, it doesn't have to be that bad. I listened to this woman's story and I was like amazed that she wasn't drinking and she wasn't doing the drugs she used to do. And she was living life and she was enjoying herself and she was, you know, um, doing all these things. And, you know, here I was thinking, you know, my best bet was I was going to die. And so I went to her and talked to her and she got me into um, Mercy Rehab back in 1989. My first meeting down in that basement, it was the drop-in meeting and there was a room and there was this whole circle of chairs. And I was sitting there in my pajamas and my little green slippers and the robe and I was looking down at the ground. And we went around and introduced ourselves. And that was the first time ever that I ever uttered the words, a Marianne or an alcoholic. Um, so my recovery started. I really wasn't quite sure, but the one thing that kept me coming back was that first meeting after that drop-in meeting was a speaker's meeting. And the hope that I felt in that hall, I, I, can't, I can't describe it. You know, there were these people, they were laughing, they were enjoying life and telling jokes and intermingling and you know and it was nothing that I had ever seen before because I was so stuck in myself and my disease and the self-pity and the wanting to die and you know just not caring about life. You know, I used to say that I used to take the Rubik's Cube and I used to try to figure that sucker out and I would turn it and I would twist it and, you know, and that's what I did in the program and, you know, and I can tell you, there is no other way to do it. It's simple, but it's, it's complicated. You just have to do it. Six years ago for me, you know, um, something tragic happened. And um, I learned a big lesson about hope, you know, I, I even more. And I learned more about my higher power. Um, 
I'd been sober about, uh, let's see, I got sober again in 2010 when I came back in um, after a, a, a ways away from the program and um, not going to meetings and not doing the things that I know keep me sober and keep me on a straight and narrow um, I, I used, uh, um, let's see, I used everything that I've learned in this program because I went in to have a knee replacement um, in 2014, um, I needed right, my right knee replaced and um, I learned uh, a pretty valuable lesson about um, my gut instinct and listening to that gut instinct because inside that's God speaking. and. Um, Something told me not to let them put a needle in my spine, but you know, I I didn't listen to it, and um, I ended up um, with blood clot in my spine. Um, they did spinal anesthesia, and um, a day and a half later, I lost complete feeling below my waist. And um, I tell you, I really had to rely on this program the people in this program, um, my my wife, my partner, um, has been there th through thick and thin, and so haven't the people in the program. And and that's what, you know, um, keeps me going. Um, you know, I pray every day. I have this unbelievable um, faith in my higher power, and, you know, the things that... Um, that I've been able to accomplish just in the last years. You know, the doctor looked at me after the surgery. Um, I had pins and needles below my waist. Um, he looked at me and said, I don't know if you'll ever walk again. He said, I removed the blood clot, um, but I can't promise you your walk. And I looked at him and I said, oh, I'll walk again. I said, you don't know who you're talking to. You know, um, I have faith. You know, I I know with my faith, my higher power, and the people that are in my life, I'm gonna walk again. You know, and um, I am. You know, six years later, um, even with all this stuff going on, um, I'm driving again. I got my license, um, and I got a part-time job. I started working again. Life has just been, it's just been incredible, you know? Um, I've learned through all the, all the crap in, in my past, at age 49 when this happened, um, I started enjoying life. It's like I did a, a 360, you know? I learned that, you know, just the little things in life that we take for granted. Um, you know, I have some physical limitations. I'm, I'm in a wheelchair. I have to walk with crutches and I have to walk with health and the aid of uh, braces. But you know what? I'm not sitting in a nursing home filled with, um, you know, opioids because I decided to give up. I was given a challenge and you know, I remember the one thing that um, I read when I was in New England rehab for uh, two and a half months learning to walk again, um, social media became very important to me. And, and that's one of the reasons why I chose to do this is because, you know, I've been stuck in the house and I know what it's like not to be able to go out and to intermingle. And so, Everything that I saw on social media in the beginning, there was this one, um, there was this one post, and this is what did it for me. And I, I wrote it down because I'm like, I need to read this because this is what started it for me. You know, there I was, not being able to walk and not knowing what was going on, and somebody had posted this on Facebook, and it said, "Where you are today is no accident." God is using the situation you are in right now to shape and prepare you for the place he wants to bring you into tomorrow. Trust him with his plan, even if you don't understand it. 
And I'll tell you what, I did not understand it. I did not understand it, but I was in. I said, okay, God, I don't know where you're going with this. I have no idea where this is going to be, but I am in 100%. I'm going to do what it is you put in front of me to do. And that's the attitude that I had. And I've, I was able to use all the tools that I had in the program to apply them when I was in that rehab and didn't know which way was up. God taught me an important lesson and that, you know, my life is worth it and your life is worth it too. And you can do this. I'm, I'm honest to God, you know, I've been a doubting Thomas from the get go, you know, and I've played with this program and I've twisted it and I've, and I've tried to do it every other way, except the one way they asked me to do. And that's the work, you know, you, you, you get a sponsor. You start praying, you find a higher power, you know, you get involved in the meetings, you make coffee, you get a job on your home group, you let people get to know you, you know, and that was one of the big things for me um, early on is I didn't really, when I was in and out, in and out, I never really let anybody get to know me, you know, I didn't want to share at meeting, I didn't want to go to coffee, I didn't, you know, I wanted to get this through osmosis or something, you know, I didn't think I had to do the steps. But when I, I finally let go and, and I started doing it, you know, in 2010 when I came back, and that's my sobriety date is June 5th, 2010, um, I was broken again, you know. Um, I'd gone on a three-year bender with um, prescription drugs because of uh, a surgery. And, um, you know, and there I was again back at step one, you know. I was just like, I was at this place in South Portland. I had tried to kill myself. And, um, you know, I had to go to emergency and get my pumps, my stomach pumped. And, um, you know, a spiritual experience happened to me and it got me back into the program and it got me working even harder. And um, I'm just so proud of, you know, the program and what it does for people you know it, it gives us it gives us life back you know we can be active members of society again you know our families they they come back around you know when you're living you know it, one of the early things people said was you know watch people's feet you know you hear them talk from the podium but watch their feet when their feet match what they're talking those are the people you want to be around You know, my life today is second to none, even though I'm sitting here in a wheelchair, you know. Um, I've had to face some pretty, you know, some pretty s severe things. You know, I've, I've been sick for the last six years. I was suffering from chronic urinary tract infections, one of the, you know, um, things from my, uh, the, the surgery and the injury was I lost my um, bladder function because of a spinal cord injury and the blood clot. Um, so there are still limitations that I have, but I've been able to learn how to deal with them. You know, if I'm upset and, and you know, anxious and stuff, all I need to do is just to just breathe, you know, and take a time out focus on my breathing and meditate, you know, the answers will come. When I calm my mind, the answers will come, you know. Um, so I know this was kind of all jumbled around, um, but, you know, I really wanted to focus on what life has become for me. You know, um, my experience, you know, I, you know, I had, I had to, I had to drink um, and go through what I went through to get me to this place that I am today. And I thank God for that. I thank God every day that I, I wake up and it's like, oh my God, another beautiful day. Um, and I try as best I can to share positive um, things on social media because that was big for me. That's where it started my recovery from the spinal cord injury. So, you know, every day I try to put something out there on social media that's 
positive, that's um, encouraging, um, that gives hope, that amplifies hope. I really loved what you guys did on Facebook about amplifying hope. Because, you know, if it wasn't for hope, I would have given up on this a long, long time ago. I'd probably be dead and I wouldn't be living the life that I'm living today, you know, doing the things that I do. Um, you know, I have, um, well, we used to have five uh, Shih Tzus, we're down to one, and a cat. Um, we love to, you know, go for rides and, and go to the beach and um, go up to Sugarloaf. You know, I'm really bummed that it's, um, canceled this year but you know what we need to stay safe we need to stay safe so that we can you know continue to live and and prosper you know recovery is possible if we can continue to amplify hope and people have faith um you know great things are possible Yeah, I came from a home where there was active alcoholism. Um, my father was a heavy drinker. He was a World War II fighter pilot um, who brought the war home with him. But I started with alcohol probably um, 15, 16, and then started using um, marijuana about age 17. And by the time I got into college, I went to acting school um, at Carnegie Mellon University. I was eventually advised to withdraw, and that really literally had a lot to do with um, my um, use because I got into psychedelics and I got into, you know, other stuff. But mostly it was alcohol that took the edge off, and I started to develop a tolerance for alcohol. And by the time I was ending my career with alcohol, my average consumption was about half a gallon of vodka a day. The disease took me down, and I finally reached that point of no return. I believe in guardian angels um, because there have been one or two episodes in my life where they have shown up. Uh, but this was a case where the guardian angel, my father, um, it was my father, he committed suicide when I was 15. And I just remember saying, oh God, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I just can't do this. And that's when the voice came. It was my father's voice. And, um, and I can't explain why, but there, there it was. And it said, the voice said, it's not your time to go yet. Get help now. So um, that's how long ago it was. It was November 1st of 1981. So I woke up 36 hours later and my sister had left my favorite science fiction anthology in a carton of Camel non-filters on my bedside table. <laughs> and I had a pair of pajamas that didn't fit and a seersucker bathrobe and those foam slippers with the have a nice day smiles on them that were this ugly olive green color. And, um, and there I was at the Salvation Army. I remember people at those meetings where they said, look, you, it's not about stopping for the rest of your life it's about taking it a day at a time and anybody can take it a day at a time an hour at a time a minute at a time but, and i started attending two meetings a day i went i said hit hit 90 meetings in 90 days what i know about vulnerability is, is and about group therapy and why those things work and why things like aa meetings work is that if i can risk putting something out there um, and risk that you're either going to come down on me or you're going to leave. But be that vulnerable and say, look, I'm hurting right now and I need some help with this. Or, you know, I'm in a lot of pain or I'm in major grief because I just lost somebody. You know, I lost a good friend or I lost a relative. Or my marriage, you know, whatever went south. But if I can talk about that, that brings a vulnerability for somebody else when i'm that vulnerable that creates greater safety that's the paradox behind it if i can say hey look there's something going on with me then that gives somebody else in that group permission to say hey wait a minute me too me too and that's what creates greater intimacy and greater safety is the ability to be vulnerable and so now 
Well, I'm able to laugh at myself. I'm able to, when people make fun of me, I'm able to still laugh at myself. You know, I might bristle a little bit initially, but, but I'm also able to accept some criticism when somebody says, hey, you know, I've got an issue I need to talk to you about, and here's my issue. Hey, look, there's a bright spot in this world, you know, that I'm entitled to if I'm willing to do the soul work. So that's kind of where things are at, pretty much with me at this point.